Good morning, and thank you for those of you that joined us in person. It's been a while since I've had people in the room, so bear with me. Um, today, I'm going to talk about what's new in JDK 20. Now that we have a feature release every six months, part of my job is to go about and tell you about the JEPs and what has been added. So I'll read all of the JEPs and condense them so that you don't have to read them. You can just hear this session and then decide which ones you want to learn more about. We will cover the ones that just came out this morning in JDK 20. So JDK 20 is the first release of 2023, and it's the last release prior to the upcoming next uh, long-term support version. JDK 20 replaces JDK 19 and will in turn be superseded by JDK 21 later this year in September. And JDK 20, as you can see here by the light color, is offered under the no fee terms and conditions, so everyone can use it in production at no cost. We have uh, seven JEPs, all of which are either incubator JEPs or preview JEPs. Now, most library improvements start as incubators. Once they're mature enough, they might be added to, uh, uh, to the standard, or in some cases, they may move on to previews. Preview mode is a step closer to being added to the standard. Features in preview are already fully specified, and they're completely implemented and tested, so they're good, but they are impermanent, so they might change in the next release. Previews are the usual way to test language features and JVM en enhancements because those cannot be constrained to an incubator module. And using a preview feature requires that you accept that the code might not work exactly as is in the next release. So to ensure that you know that you're doing that, when you're compiling code with preview features, you're gonna have to pass a flag and let it know, yes, I know what I'm doing. And in order to avoid somebody uh, sneaking a preview feature to, into a library that you use, you also have to pass a flag at runtime. Now, we've grouped the uh, JEPs on this release into three parts. The language features, which come from Project Amber. We have library improvements, and they come from Project Panama, these two. And we have three improvements that are from Project Loom, which aim to update how Java manages concurrency. So let's dive right into those. We always start with the language features because these are the ones that are most likely to impact the largest number of developers, and they're also the most fun to showcase. JDK 20 brings back a second preview for record patterns, uh, which makes it much easier to deconstruct records and operate on their components. Record patterns can be nested to access data at any level of the record hierarchy. So let's take an example. Before we go, though, let's review the two changes that made this possible. JDK 16 introduced pattern matching to the instance of operator. So prior to this change, if we wanted to do something with an object, um, if, if it was a certain type, we'd have to do a test. Then we have to declare a variable, then manually cast it, and then we can use it. With pattern matching, we can do all of that in a single line. JDK 16 also brought in records, which simplified the creation of classes that are used just to simple carriers of immutable data. Records are more than just a way of typing a little bit less when you're declaring a class. Knowing that a class is a record will allow us to do some interesting optimizations like the ones that we're going to have in now with record patterns. So in JDK 20, we can see a combination of these two with pattern matching and record classes. In this example, we have defined a record class called point with the expected components x and y. Now, in this print sum method, we want to first test if the object we received is a point, and if it is, we want to use the values of that point. Notice that intermediate variable p that has you know, a different uh, orangish color. We've only created it to access the x and y values. It would be better if we could not only test to see if it's a p, if it's a point, but also extract those values and let us use it directly. In other words, right, this is the new code and the part that's highlighted, point, int x, int y, that's a record pattern. 
the true power of pattern matching is that it scales elegantly to match more complicated object graphs. So let's consider the following declarations. Let's make the point a little bit more complicated, right? Let's, let's introduce a color. And then we defined a color point as a point with a color. And we define a rectangle as two color points. Now, we can extract the components of an object with a record pattern. If we wanted to get the colors from the upper left, we could write something like this, right? And we have the upper left dot color. But again, you see here that I'm using the upper left only to access the color. If we can nest the record patterns, we could deconstruct that first uh, part, th that first uh, uh, color point into its components and access directly the parts that I need. What's more, I can use uh, the variable, uh, the var keyword, so that I don't have to define the types. I can just infer them. And that makes it a slightly easier to read, especially if I'm not going to use them. Now, the second preview, I mentioned this is the second preview of it. It has added support for record patterns to appear in the headers of enhanced for statements. In this example here, if we wanted to iterate over a group of points and do something with the components, we don't have to introduce that extra variable points and then read them. We can get the values directly. JDK 20 also brings us pattern matching on switch expressions and statements. Now, using this feature, we can test an expression against a number of different patterns. In the past, switch statements used to work only on a few types, like a numeric, an enum, and a string. Uh, in JDK 14, we introduced switch expressions and allowed other case labels. But you still couldn't switch to test an object against an expression to see if it belonged to a particular type. The best we could do at the time was uh, a collection of chained if else if statements. Pattern matching for switch extends the case labels to include the patterns and null in the, in the list of uh, cases. So we can make this code dramatically simpler. Now, as a bonus, this is not just easier to read, but this is optimizable by the compiler. Now, the case statement has to be exhaustive. So in most cases, you do want to add a default value. And now that we can test for null inside the switch, you don't have to check for the variables null case outside of it. Now, to maintain backward compatibility, if you only have a default label, it will not match null. But you could put null and default in the same case if you want to treat them the same way. Now, after a successful pattern match, it is often the case that we need to do some further tests, right? In this case, we have, OK, we want to do something with strings, but we want to do something special if um, the string is, the, if the, is of length 1. Now, we can improve this if we can mix a combination of the pattern matching and the condition. So now we can put pattern matching and an extra condition allowing uh, with the when clause, right? So now in this case, the first case will match strings of length one, and every other strings will be caught by the second case. Now, the when clause can use any pattern variables declared in the pattern in the case label. We have to be careful with the order of these expressions now. If we were to invert the order, then the case string S would catch every string, including the ones of length one, and that would be an error. So that would be dominating, a pattern would dominate the second one. So doing so will result in a compile time exception. As before, the switch statements need to be exhaustive, so you may want to throw in a default value in there, unless you're enumerating on an enum or on a sealed class, and you are covering all the possible values in your statements. So those were the language features. Now let's take a look at the changes in the library. Now, the Java libraries are one of the reasons why Java has become so popular. They handle most of the hardest jobs, like implementing cryptography algorithms or figuring out the logic for multi-threading when you want to sort some collection. They also handle all of the tasks that are common that most developers want to do, and they're kind of tedious and you know, it'd be hard to get them all right all the time. JDK 20 brings us one preview 
and one incubator. Both of them from Project Panama, which aims to make it possible to interoperate between Java code and foreign code. And when we say foreign, we mean anything that's not Java. The first step is a second preview of the foreign function and memory APIs. Now, the goal of this feature is to make it simple for Java programs to use functions written in languages other than Java, initially in C and to safely access memory that is not under the control of the JVM. We already have the Java native interface, interface JNI, to access non-Java code, but it's very cumbersome and it requires code to be maintained in C on top of Java. So this replacement that we're working on should have the performance as good as or as better than the current alternatives. And what are the alternatives? Historically, you have one of two ways to access foreign memory. There is the supported way, which uses byte buffer. And there is the hacky way using sang, misc, and safe. Byte buffer is limited to two gigabyte size regions. Now, now this used to be large enough, uh, but it really nowadays isn't. So you probably have some systems where you may need to access more than two gigabytes. Um, and there's also uh, the problem that if you use byte buffer, you can't really tell the JVM when to deallocate the memory. You'll just be subject to whenever the garbage collector goes through it, it'll catch it and then it'll do it. So if you don't like those two constraints, you could use Sun Misc and Safe. It's an internal JDK API, which gives you all the control you could possibly want, and probably a lot more than what you wanted. Uh, as the name implies, it is unsafe. So you're using a non-standard API, which means it's not guaranteed to remain the same in some future version of the platform, not even on an update of that release, though we haven't changed it in many years and we have no intentions to do so yet. Right? Um, you also won't get any help from the platform in deallocating memory. So if you get it wrong, and it's quite easy to get it wrong, you can have some unexpected errors that you normally wouldn't see on a Java application including not just the JVM crashing, but also some silent memory corruption. So, you know, not really good choices here, right? Now, for accessing foreign functions, that is for running a library that it's not written in Java, we currently only have JNI, right? And it, it's, it's possible to do it, but it's very clunky. So, in order to use JNI, you'll have to maintain uh, a Java API, a C header file, and a C implementation that will actually call the library. And that means that, unlike the rest of your Java code, you will have to use uh, different tool chains for each platform, because you, know, you need different tool chains for C in each one of the platforms that you support. And, and you wanna have to keep those artifacts in sync with the Java library. If the Java, I'm sorry, with the non-Java library. Now, if that non-Java library is moving quickly, this can become a lot of work. You also have to deal with the difference between Java, uh, the Java type and the C type systems, right? Java uses objects, C uses struct, and you have to unpack that using native code. Some developers choose to simplify this by flattening their objects, you know, or worse, you can go back to Sun, Misc, and Safe and start moving addresses around, and you're back in unsafe mode. So the new foreign function and memory API offers classes and interfaces that will allow you to allocate foreign memory, manipulate and access that foreign memory, control the timing of that allocation, the allocation, call foreign functions, and let's take a look at that. How will that look like? So you don't have to really go through the whole code. I'm just gonna quickly point some details here. Let's say we want to sort some string, and we have a C library that has a function called rad radix sort. First thing, we need to get a handle for that. So we use the linker and C symbol lookup, and a couple of lines of just Java code, and there we go. We have now a handle to the library. The second step is to put our variables in some location in memory, or in the heap. Uh, so we create some uh, variables, some strings to put them in there. Step three, we need to properly manage off heap memory. We do this by using the try with resources. So we can, we're sure now that 
regardless of what happens, the memory is going to be freed as soon as it's no longer needed, whether there's an error or not. So that makes it much simpler. Step four, we need to create an off heap place to put all of our variables. Step five, and uh, we have to iterate and copy our variables into off heap. You see now, you know, this may look a little complicated, but if you've written JNI code, this is very simple, right? Step six, we're using the handles to call our library, and then we copy the memory from off heap back to on heap. Now, what's marked here as step eight, that's handled for you by the JVM, right? So we'll, we'll take care of all the memory, and it'll happen as soon as you go through that line of code, error or no error. Now, if you have written any JNI code, this should look dramatically simpler. And if you haven't written any JNI code with any luck on these APIs, you probably never will have to. The second API improvement is in a fifth incubator, and I think that's a record. That's the longest incubators we've had so far. This is the vector API. Now, vector computations allow systems to execute operations on vectors instead of applying the same operation to several values one at a time. And this can result in significant performance improvements. Hotspot already supports auto vectorization. So it sometimes can detect when a scalar operation can be transformed to super word operations and mapped to vector instructions. The problem is that the set of operations is very limited and it's fragile to the changes in the code shape. So with this API, it will be possible to write very complex vector algorithms in Java in a way that will be productable, I'm sorry, predictable and robust. Uh, vector APIs under the hood use some of the foreign functions and memory APIs that I just talked about, which are already mature enough that we feel comfortable you know, creating this dependency. Here is a conceptual model of a vector operation. Instead of needing to repeat an operation multiple times, we can achieve the same result with a single pass. All right? Pretty straightforward. Now, the goals of the vector API are to create APIs that are clear and concise. So you should be, uh, you could, you should be able to create a wide, a wide range of vector computations consisting of a sequence of vector operations with loops and possible control flow. It has to be platform agnostic, so it should be CPU architecture agnostic. Uh, and as usual, in Java APIs, when there is some um, platform optimization or portability conflicts, we will bias towards portability. We want reliable runtime and performance. That means that on capable x64 and arch64 architectures, the Java runtime will compile vector operations to corresponding efficient and performant instructions. You should have confidence that they will reliably express vector operations in a map that closely maps the vector instructions available for that system. And finally, we want graceful degradation. So sometimes you will run on a system that will not be capable of running vector operations, and we want whatever you wrote to be no worse than if you had unrolled this and run it sequentially. Now, the last three JEPs from JDK20 come to us from the project that's going on in, in Loom. Project Loom began in late 2017, and it aims to make it possible to write Java programs that handle IO-bound tasks in a way that is easy to read, understand, and debug, but also match the performance that is currently associated only to more complicated uh, code, such as that that uses react reactive frameworks. Before we dig in, let's try to explain why we started looking into a way of having lighter threads. If you have an extremely simple system with a single core and a task that is CPU intensive, then you just use a single thread and you'll have all your CPU properly utilized all of the time. But modern computers are not single core. The norm now in anything except like the most simple device is to have multiple cores. In our example, if this system has eight cores, then a single thread running one of those cores will keep all of the other ones idle. So you know, 
simple solution, if we can split the task, we can do something much better. We could create up to eight threads, and if all of them are doing CPU intensive tasks, then those eight threads will give you 100% CPU utilization, and we can do the work eight times faster. Now, adding more threads, if your limiting factor is the CPU, will not make this go any faster. We only have eight cores. This is what a CPU bound application looks like. But what if those threads are not using the processor all of the time? What if the threads are only working half of the time? Then those eight threads will keep my CPUs at only 50%. So what could we do? Simple, right? We could double the number of threads per CPU. And now, since each one is working half of the time, with 16 threads, we keep our eight cores happy. And if the threads were working only a quarter of the time, well, you know, you need 32 threads. You can see a pattern, right? If you had a thread working 1% of the time, then 99% of the time they're waiting, so you can have 800 threads in our eight core system all doing profitable work. Now, if this sounds a little extreme, systems on which the task is waiting most of the, of the time um, are actually pretty common, right? That's what we call an I.O. bound application. If your threads are waiting for something that's, say, from the network, um, then 1% of the time could even be too much, right? You, you probably could be talking at one ten thousandth of the time. That's what your threads would be working on. Now, if it was this simple and you could just keep adding threads forever, we, we wouldn't be having this conversation, right? But at some point, the CPU ceases to be your concern. The current Java concurrency model tells you to use one thread for every task. And then behind the scenes, Java will create an OS thread for each one of those Java threads. Java will make it possible for you to use OS threads without having to learn the idioms of a particular OS thread for a particular platform. But the operating system threads are relatively expensive, right? Each one will require a couple of kilobytes of metadata, but they also will reserve about one megabyte of heap, whether the thread needs it or not. This in practice means that for most platforms, you will be limited to a few thousand threads. And even though that will be plenty for a CPU-bound application, it's going to be too little for an I.O.-bound application. OK? So if we're limited by the number of OS threads, before Loom, we have two options, neither of which was really good. We could use the Java threads and assign one thread to each request. This will make the code easy to read. And all of the debugging tools that are built into the JDK will work just fine, right? If you get a stack trace, you will read it, and it will make perfect sense. But you will be wasting resources. You won't be able to use all of your CPU. And there will be a lot of memory that's allocated and not really used. Or you can code around this one thread per request restriction and make it so that a single OS thread can handle multiple requests. This can be done using tools and frameworks like Reactive Framework. Doing so will lead to much more requests being uh, handled by every um, OS thread, so much better CPU utilization. But it comes at a terrible price. The programming model is now very unintuitive. It is very easy to get it wrong. And if you do get it wrong, all of the debugging tools that you're familiar with will not work. I mean, you, they'll work, but if you get a stack trace, it'll be impossible to figure out what's going on, or near so. I'm sure somebody here could do it. I certainly couldn't. JDK 20 will bring back virtual threads for a second preview. Virtual threads are lightweight threads that will allow a Java developer to continue using that familiar one thread per task mode, so you can write code that it's easy to understand and it's easy to maintain. From a developer point of view, a virtual thread is very similar to a Java thread. But behind the scenes, it is no longer tied to a single operating system thread. Virtual threads will allow us to achieve near optimal hardware optimization without asking us to change the way that we code. 
When we use virtual threads, all of the tools that we've used for debugging behave as they did with regular threads. So that's good. For most developers, switching to virtual threads will require going from the, uh, will switching from platform threads to virtual threads. Pretty straightforward. They are assigned by the VM to a carrier OS thread only for as long as they need the CPU. When the thread waits, the JVM will pause it, unmount them, and assign the carrier OS thread to some other virtual thread that is ready to get some CPU work done. Later, whenever our first virtual thread needs the CPU again, the JVM will assign it to whatever OS thread happens to be available at the time. It could be the same one, or it could be a different one, and nobody cares. Now, there are two scenarios on which a virtual thread cannot be unmounted uh, uh, because they're blocking, right? It's when it executes code inside a synchronized block or method, or when it's calling a native method or a foreign function. So the Java team has spent a lot of time and effort updating the code of the JDK itself so that within the Java libraries, we don't have this problem. Still, some of your own code might still have this situation. So now, as part of the work to do Lumen to test it, a small group of people from the Helidon team, and by small, I mean one person full time and one person half time, they collaborated to create a prototype replacement for Netty called WARP. Now, Netty is used for high performance protocol servers and clients. Now, Netty doesn't use the model of the simple one thread, one, uh, one task per request, but it has its own set of APIs to allow to multiplex those shares. Now, Netty has been around since 2004. It's actively maintained, so it has about 18 years worth of hard work and optimizations. Using Loom and very dumb asynchronous code and a little tuning, the Helidon team was able to get similar performance in just six weeks. Right? And more importantly, the code for warp is much easier to read, maintain, and understand, and debug. Right? We got a nice quote here from uh, Thomas Longer from the Project Helidon team about how they never encountered some of the problems that they expected to run into when they were doing this. Now, because they're real Java threads and not some other abstraction, existing code uh, will just work when running on virtual threads. They work with thread local, they give you the same stack traces and the same thread dumps and with the same debugger and profiling tools. This graph here shows Jetty. Remember that I said that you could just create more threads, right? Well, if you tell it, let's try to run it and say, at most, I want to create 200 threads, right? Now there's a task, 100 milliseconds IO bound. You can see how you know, in the little blue one here, the first tasks, everything looks fantastic. And then eventually you run into the point where I really needed more threads. So the latency of the threads just, you know, like it falls off a cliff. All of a sudden everybody's waiting for the threads. Now you can postpone that. You know, this uses a certain amount of memory, but you said, hey, you know, this is, this, I got a lot of memory. Instead of 200 threads, why don't I give it 800 threads? And sure enough, if you do that, you can see that you can handle a lot more requests, but eventually you go into the same problem. And this uses a heck of a lot more memory, even though your program may not need it. Now using Loom, there is a line at the bottom that's barely visible. You can use, you can create as many threads as needed. We couldn't get it to the point where it would just be waiting. So you can see here that, you know, that's what you want to see. It just continues creating threads as many as you need. Now, a great deal of the work that we did on Loom had nothing to do with stack swapping magic or anything. It was clearing the roadblocks in the JDK. So we had to find all of the places in the JDK where blocking might happen and replace it with logic that if it was running on a virtual thread, would pause the virtual thread, free up the carrier thread, and make it available for somebody else. Much of this was done in earlier gems. So if you go and look around in JDK uh, 13, 15, and 18, we re-implemented several libraries looking forward to this. This also had the benefit of making sure that 
some of the old code that we had in those libraries could be cleaned up. So in the end, Loom made almost no significant changes to the JDK APIs, except for the new structured concurrency API that we will see in a minute. But it provides better implementations of the existing uh, familiar abstractions. So if you wrote your own code using threads, you might need to do the same thing that we did and find all of the places where your code won't play nice with virtual threads. So in order to help you with that, there is now a JDK flight recorder event that it's emitted whenever a thread blocks while it's been. And we have properties to, you know, when that happens, give me the full thread or give me just partial stack. So hopefully that'll help you clean up your own code. Now, since we expect code writing with Loom will have many more threads, we also need to improve how data is passed from the caller to the callee. Developers have traditionally used thread local variables to help components share data without resorting to method arguments. Now, despite looking like an ordinary variable, a thread local variable has multiple incarnations, one per thread. And the particular incarnation that is used depends on which thread calls get or set. Unfortunately, they have some numerous design flaws that are impossible to avoid. Every thread local variable is mutable, right? So it allows this in order to support bidirectional communication. But this can lead to a spaghetti code. A second problem is that they have an unbounded lifetime. Once a thread is set, the incarnation is returned until um, the thread dies or the developer calls remove. And many developers forget to call remove, so memory just keeps getting wasted. And finally, they have some expensive inheritance, because if you grab a thread and you inherit it, the new child thread will have to allocate memory for all of the parent threads local variables. Now, it's much more common to need a one-way transmission from one component from caller to callee. And if we accept that constraint you know, and don't have um, bidirectional communication, we can use scoped values, which are dramatically more efficient for this purpose. JDK 20 also delivers APIs for structured concurrency. Now, the principle for structured concurrency is quite straightforward. When there's sequential code that splits into concurrent flows, they must join back in the same code unit. If you write code in this way, then the error handling and cancellation can be streamlined, and it makes it much easier to read and debug. So like structured programming codified best practices into the language for sequential code, structured concurrency does the same for concurrent code. Let's take some sample code. The principal class of the structured concurrency API is structured task scope. It's the first variable here in orange. This class will allow developers to structure a task as a family of concurrent subtasks. And you can coordinate them as a unit. Now, the subtasks are executed in their own threads by forking them. That's the scope fork, the, the next orange. And then joining them as a unit and possibly canceling them as a unit. Now, when you have it written like this, understanding the lifetime of the threads is easy. Under every condition, the lifetime is confined to the body of the try with resources statement, right? The use of structured task scopes ensures that if either the find user or the fetch order subtasks fall, the other will be canceled if it has not yet been completed. If the thread that's calling the parent, the, the handle, is interrupted before or during the call of the join, both forks will be canceled automatically for you. And you can clearly see the structure here, right? You set up the subtasks, wait for them to complete or be canceled, and then decide um, whether to succeed or fail. And if the subtasks are already finished, there's nothing to clean up. If you need to debug this code, a thread dump will display the task's hierarchy. So you will be able to find, find user and fetch order as children of this scope because it follows the discipline of waiting for child tasks, some of the most error-prone aspects um, of you know, cancellations and shutdowns are dramatically simpler. Now, I hope you've learned a few things about the JEPs that are coming with JDK 20. 
As usual, if you found any of these explanations useful, all of the credit belongs to the authors of the GEPs. If you, could, if you wanna read more about it, you can go to the OpenJDK page and there'll be links to each one of them. Each one of those GEPs will have cases that I left out, some technical discussions about why some decisions were being made and uh, what has changed between the previous preview and the current preview and lots more. Now, the GEPs are only the largest unit of change in each JDK release. There are many other changes that don't rise to the level of requiring a JEP, even some that required a JEP in the past. Um, for example, uh, the Unicode support for new versions. That used to be a JEP, now it's so routine that we're just calling it to a task. Now, uh, if you're a quick reader, you will find some things that may be of interest to you. We are disabling DTLS 1.0, not to be confused with TLS 1.0, that was disabled in JDK 16. But if you happen to be using it, then you probably wanna read more about it. So we have, in the release notes, highlighted these higher level 48 release changes, which I will now cover in detail. Just kidding, you can read those on your own time um, at the end of the session. But if you do wanna learn more about them, I recommend that you look at the blogs from a couple of my colleagues from the Java development, Java Developer Relationship Team, sorry. Uh, Nikolai Pargo, Parlog and Thomas Schatz have written some pretty good articles that cover some of the improvements in JDK 20 in more detail and that are you know, quite fun to read. They have their own websites where they post, so you can have the URLs there, but if you don't wanna look them up, you don't wanna remember these, just look at our Inside Java aggregator site and you can find them there. By now, you're all wondering, oh, this is fantastic. Where can I get a hold of JDK 20? Well, you can download it directly under the Oracle No Fee Terms and Conditions from the main JDK download page in oracle.com. Now, JDK versions that are offered under those licenses don't need a click-through. So that means that we can make them available to you using downloadable scripts. The links that you will get, if you just right-click and say save link, you can just paste them into a curl or a wget and automatically use them to download the current version of JDK 20. In April, when we switch to 20.01, these URLs will give you 20.01. So you don't need to go and change anything. You can just burn them in there. There is also a little box over there that explains how to use them and which packages you have. And if you, have, you, know, if you wanna use zip instead of an exe, it'll give you all of the options there. Now, if you prefer not to build them yourself, but you wanna grab some Docker images, with JDK 20. We'll make those available in Oracle Linux 8 uh, through containerregistry.oracle.com. And if you'd like to build your own images, perhaps you wanna tweak them a little bit, the Docker files that we use to create them are published in our GitHub uh, Docker images page. So you can use those as a sample to create your own Docker files. With that, good morning to all of you. <laughs>